it's safe to say that the last decade of gaming has presented some masterpieces in the entire history of the medium. From Portal 2 to Bioshock Infinite, to The Last of Us, to Telltale's The Walking Dead, to The Witcher 3, etc, etc. Video games have evolved from simple fun things to pass our time, to engaging well thought out stories with gameplay to help immerse yourself in those worlds. For me, however, my personal favorite game to come out of the last decade was a little known game called Life is Strange. Released throughout 2015 from a developer not well known by the public, it somehow made waves as a contender for one of the best games of the year, winning awards from Games for Impact from the Game Awards, as well as winning the BAFTA for Best Video Game Story. Despite it taking the gaming world by storm during its release window from January to October of 2015, we actually know very little about the development history of the game. Considering it's my favorite game of all time, I decided to sit down and catalog what I could find about the development history of Life is Strange up until the release of its first episode, Chrysalis, in January of 2015. Before anything else, I think we need to talk about Don't Nod, the development studio behind Life is Strange. The French Paris-based studio was founded in 2008 by Hervé Bonin, Aleski Barclat, Alain Damasio, Oscar Gilbert, and Jean-Maxime Morris. The group consisted of those who previously worked for Ubisoft, EA, and Criterion Games. From 2008 until 2011, the company worked on a single game as a PlayStation 3 exclusive, an RPG called Remember Me. However, by 2011, Sony had cut ties with the project, leaving the studio in limbo without a publisher. Of course, we know what happens, and the game would eventually be saved and turned into an action-adventure title by Capcom, eventually releasing in June of 2013. Remember Me is a game that most people don't think about, let alone talk about, either. Despite average reviews, the game didn't sell well outside of Europe, which eventually led to rumors that Don't Nod had filed for bankruptcy. This, in reality, was only partially true. Remember Me didn't manage to sell as well as the French studio had hoped, with Capcom never actually working with the studio after the release. It left the tiny studio with major financial problems, however they never actually did file for bankruptcy. CEO Oscar Gilbert would say after the release of their first title, After that, we had to restructure the company and reinvent ourselves. Before, what we had wanted to do was make big games with large teams and long production cycles, so we had to change that, do something smaller with smaller teams. We didn't want to just do a small game, we also wanted to bring something new to the market, and we did it pretty well with Life is Strange. In reality, the company had to undergo severe restructuring after the realization that they would need to focus on smaller overall projects, and many publications mistook this as filing for total bankruptcy. Luckily for the studio, only two months prior to the release of Remember Me, a smaller game was already in very early pre-production, one that would alter the course of the company forever. In order to really understand Life is Strange's development, we have to talk about a certain other game that had been released several months before its initial conception, that game being Telltale's The Walking Dead. Telltale had been single-handedly keeping episodic choice-based narrative games alive for years. From Sam and Max to Back to the Future the game, the company had found a niche loyal fan base, but not enough to break into the mainstream market. Of course, this changed with the release of their adaptation of The Walking Dead, which at the time was extremely popular, and at the height of its fame with its AMC television series. The game itself is a masterpiece, winning several Game of the Year awards in 2012, simply showing how marvelous it actually was. Though, even if the game did have its own clearly defined ending, the choices in the game did matter to some extent, and how everyone playing would have a unique experience with the choices they made. This was extremely successful and essentially revived the mostly dormant genre of gaming. Telltale would continue to crank out successes such as The Wolf Among Us, an adaptation of Game of Thrones, another popular TV show, and even their own version of Batman. It was easy to see that episodic games could still work in the modern age. Thus, when it came time for Life is Strange's conception, episodic releases were how it would eventually come out. I previously spoke about how Life is Strange's development history is mostly unknown. 
All we really know about this period of time is coming from articles and interviews from around the internet. There's never been an official Life is Strange art book or something of the sort where commentary on development of a game can often be found. Side note, yes I know the limited edition of physical release has an art book. No, I don't count that since it's 32 pages and it has no commentary. With the information I've managed to gather about this game, I suppose we'll delve into the development history of Don't Nod's Life is Strange. Before it was Life is Strange, the game actually took on a very different name altogether. It was called What If, a simple name, but it gets the point across about the main themes about time rewinding and what if I changed my decision to something else. What If began development in April of 2013. The initial reveal of the game wouldn't actually happen until August of 2014. So, what went on between these dates? The earliest known mention of What If came in October 2013 on the online French gaming website GameCult. The article primarily speaks about the mediocre sales of Don't Nod's first game, while also mentioning What If by name over a year before we'd even find out Life is Strange was even originally called that. This information came out, according to the article, because of the CNC, or the National Center for Cinema and the Moving Image, which is an agency of the French Ministry of Culture. According to them, Don't Nod sought out 200,000 euros to help fund their new project. Despite this, not much is actually known about what is going on with What If during this time period. All we know at this time is that the CNC helped fund the prototype for the game that would eventually become Life is Strange. Unfortunately, we know very little about the game between April 2013 and June 2014, for you see, this is when we would first hear about Don't Nod's newest project, Unnamed, would be partnered with the famous RPG publisher, Square Enix. While speculation flew about whether or not this project would be a new IP or one of Square's more famous franchises, development was already somewhat underway for the series. One thing we do know about this time period is that Life is Strange, according to writer Jean-Luc Cano, was pitched to seven different publishers before eventually finding a home with Square Enix. One of the major sticking points for co-directors Michel Koch and Raoul Barbet during this time was that while most publishers liked the overall idea of the game, they wanted one major change. They wanted Max to be a male protagonist. Don't Nod was very set on keeping the original vision for their game intact, and that is something commendable in and of itself. Surprisingly, Don't Nod wasn't even intending on pitching Life is Strange to Square Enix. The studio had pitched an unknown game to the publisher who rejected it. When the topic of their smaller game came up during the meeting, Square immediately jumped on it. Some of the major things we do know about early development come from concept artist Edward Kaplan. Kaplan actually did the animatic from the beginning of the video, which was shown to Square Enix in order to help explain the concept of the rewind mechanic. According to Kaplan, who confirmed an April 2013 beginning to development, revealed the team initially only consisted of 15 members, due to the finishing development of Remember Me. And thanks to Life is Strange development diary, The Butterfly Effect, we know at least three of these team members were designers. Early on, Kaplan drew much of the inspiration for the concept art he produced from Google Street Views he would look at of Oregon. Initially, he would use the details based on the hillside city of Astoria, but eventually abandoned it because of its size, eventually settling on the small semi-coastal town of Garibaldi, Oregon. Kaplan's art has a very specific look to them, each one painted as if they were specifically meant to be their own work of art. Art director Michelle Koch already had the idea that he did not want the game to look photorealistic for the time along the lines of a game like Heavy Rain. A big fan of Kaplan's personal art, Koch would ask Kaplan to continue doing more for the game's concept art in his own style. Even more importantly, this would become the franchise's defining art style. In interviews and development diaries, Koch would constantly speak for his love of independent film, especially those shown at Sundance. The indie-style hand-painted look of Kaplan's art fits right in with Koch's own preference for what he imagined the game to initially be. To him, the hand-painted look of the game's art style helped to let people put their own imagination and feelings into the game itself, something he believed could not be done with games like Heavy Rain due to their photorealistic art style. 
The concept art we do have for the game does allow us a deeper look at the ideas that were eventually scrapped for the game and did not end up in the final product. There were more simple images, such as this art of an unused classroom, or these of dorm rooms that were eventually scrapped with bunk beds, which of course implies that Max would have had a roommate at some point in development. However, the concept art does have some more interesting facts about scrapped content. At one point in development, Blackwell's mascot and the team were the Fishermen. Even within this concept art, we can see Fishermen change to Bigfoots. However, there are three images that have the most intrigue to me about scrapped content. The first image is one of Kaplan's pieces, and it's simply an image of Max looking out at the storm. The second image is another of Kaplan's, this one showing Max in hospital garb, using her rewind to avoid being hit by an oncoming bus during the storm. This leads us to our final piece of concept art. What we have here is a piece done by Gary Yamal Palma, which shows Max next to an unconscious Chloe in a hospital room. The first piece is interesting, if only because it shows Max in a very distinct pose, as if she's ready to do something to take on the storm herself. The second and third pieces, though, are related to infamous pieces of cut content from the game, which we will go over at a later date, about how these two pieces of concept art actually show cut content. Concept art can only tell us so much about the state of a game. Life is Strange's primary conception came as an opposite to Remember Me. According to John Maxine Morris, the idea of human identity was digitalized in their first video game outing, with memories being able to be accessed from outside sources. So opposite of digital, of course, is analog, which makes even more sense for Max to be so enamored with her analog Polaroid camera, able to take snapshots of memories that can be looked upon to remember. Life is Strange was always meant to invoke nostalgia within its player base, but more in a pure sense than anything else. The purity of nostalgia is different from, say, Stranger Things, where the nostalgia is just shoving Ghostbusters in your face and telling you to remember the past and love it. Early on, Life is Strange was going to take place in Seattle instead of a smaller town. Morris said at Gamescom in 2014 that Arcadia-based small-town feel allowed it to invoke autumn, nostalgia, and an all-important intimate feeling that the team felt would be lost in a much larger town. Co-director Michelle Koch also revealed the game took heavy influence from David Lynch's Twin Peaks. This can be seen in a lot of ways, from the small town in the Pacific Northwest to the odd personable town people. I think most of all, the very small town connection helps as well. Twin Peaks only really works because of its own small town nature out in the middle of nowhere. This more importantly also factors into why the main playable character is a teenager. In order to fit in more with the themes of identity and choices, a younger age was picked because of the importance of choice making during that time of life. Max's shy personality, which was always meant to be an opposite of Chloe's more headstrong one, is why she was always meant to be a female character in the first place, and more importantly, this is why Don't Nod refused to change her to a male protagonist at the behest of so many publishers. The nostalgic feeling is often seen throughout the entire final game, with Don't Nod engineering their own lighting system in order to further this feeling. Michelle Koch would note that the light in and of itself is its own actor in the game, important to give everything a warm and soft feeling. This nostalgia itself feeds back into the idea of the rewind mechanic, drawing much of its inspiration to the 1993 Bill Murray comedy Groundhog Day. The very idea of the rewind mechanic was meant for the sole purpose of making a person question their choice more than a normal game in the genre. In a game like The Walking Dead, you make a choice and move on, being forced to live with that choice. But this game offers the complete opposite, being forced to sit and wonder for a moment whether or not to change your choice before leaving the scene. The rewind mechanic, however, left the dev team with more questions than anything. Time travel in any medium requires one thing rules. While the final rules for the game include Max being able to keep her memories and keep any items on hand, this wasn't always true. Early on in development, they considered Max not having either of these, though this would probably limit the point of the actual power in-game. Though, according to Raul Barbet, early on the implementation of the actual mechanic was, as he put it, a nightmare. With only three designers working on the game early on, prior to rising up to 10 after they secured a publisher, the ability to make the actual mechanic work was an uphill struggle. When it came time for implementing it into the game, Max's love of photography would be a major inspiration for how the powers worked visually. 
Max Rewind only works for a few seconds, because it's supposed to be indicative of a film reel being pulled backwards. Once pulled to the end of the reel, it begins burning up, causing Max's headaches and nosebleeds. Double exposure plays into it as well, as two timelines become superimposed over each other until... Well, only the new one would remain after. The most important part of what we know about Life is Strange's development actually boils down to its original incarnation, What If. In June 2019, a prototype of What If was leaked onto the internet via the Hidden Palace Zone. This June 27, 2014 build specifically is one of three known prototypes for the game. The two other prototypes have often been shown off in early mentions of the game, as well in the director's commentary documentary in the game. The earliest known prototype that we know of is from extremely early on in development, possibly from when the game's team was still very small. This 50 second clip from Master Clash Zhu video shows an early modeled scene from Chrysalis. Chloe's bedroom matches up with the early concept art done by Kaplan, and we can very easily see early models for both Max and David, though Chloe has yet to be modeled, and is just a blank template. The most interesting thing in this prototype is Max herself. This early model of Max, while odd looking, actually matches up extremely well with the earliest known sketch of Max that Michelle Koch did in 2012. Though other than that, there really isn't much more to gain from this clip other than seeing how clunky the rewind mechanic was this early on in development. The second prototype is from a bit later in development, but from before the June 27th one. This was primarily seen in the director's commentary for only a couple of seconds, but it does allow us to see new models for both Max and Chloe. Max looks... Those eyes have seen things, haven't they? Though, Chloe's early model actually matches up with early concept art that shows her wearing a tank top with a rainbow on it, as opposed to the final Misfit Skulls tank top that we all know and love. Of course, finally, we have the June 27th, 2014 What If prototype. This build was for the PS3, and the music you've heard when we've talked about What If before actually is the XMB music that plays when you're about to select the game from the PS3 home menu. It's kind of... ominous, to be honest. Though, it does fit the theme of what What If would be prior to Life is Strange. Here, take a listen. Interestingly enough, despite this build being made seven months before the final release of the first episode, much of the entire game has pieces here and there all the way up until the final episode, polarized. Being made in June 2014, this was before most of the voice actors were actually cast to their roles in July, so the entire prototype lacks any actual voice acting, and is done instead with computer-generated voices and some improper English here and there. With all five episodes being somewhat accessible in this build, I think it's important to go over what does stand out about this prototype compared to the final game. The first episode, Chrysalis, is expectedly the one that's mostly finished. Right off the bat, we can take note that some textures are of lower quality than in the final game, as well as plenty of missing item models and character models and animations and other random assets throughout the world. Structure-wise, the entirety of the first episode is playable in this build. Not a lot is actually changed from the final game in this episode, however. Models reflect final character design, and the same goes for most of the locations in the world. None of Morali's score is actually present in this build, indicating that it wasn't done by this time, but it seems that they already chosen much of the licensed music present in the final game. While episode 1 is pretty close to its final game counterpart, there are some things that are different from the final game, outside of the models and assets that are missing, and the fact that the overall script hasn't been fully localized by American writer Christian Devine. Perhaps the most interesting thing that we can learn early on in this build is that at one point in development, Rachel Amber didn't exist, and surprisingly, neither did Arcadia Bay. Rather, we have Jesse Palmer and Aurora Creek, 
All of this is coming from the missing poster in the beginning of the game, which also notes that the game takes place in 2012 and not 2013 like the final game. We can take note that these also pop up in other bits of dialogue throughout the first episode. The name Jesse Palmer is, of course, a purposeful reference to Laura Palmer, a character from Twin Peaks whose death is what sets off the entire chain of events that starts the show. A peek inside of Max's journal also shows that early on in development, Max would have had character profiles in her journal for the entire cast of the game, whereas in the final game, Max only has a few character profiles for the characters that she knows personally. An interesting conversation that deviates away from the final game is the interaction with Warren in the parking lot. The conversation here lacks any references to the movies on Warren's flash drive, whereas in the final game, the conversation with Warren is all about the flash drive and what movies Max was watching on them, before we eventually get to the drive-in, where here, he asks Max out on a date directly, and you get three probable rejection choices, which are actually really funny. Funnily enough, once Chloe has Max in the truck, she asks if Warren is her boyfriend, and both answers that Max can give are essentially no. The only reason I even bring this up is because it's an interesting bit of trivia that Jean-Luc Cano had once said that Warren's role was never supposed to be that of a love interest early on in development, and this only shows that he was telling the truth. So I just thought it would be an interesting bit of trivia because it's really the only major thing that I can find in episode 1 that is starkly different from the final game. As expected, every episode from here on out is going to be less and less complete than the previous ones. We begin episode 2 with an incomplete model of Max in her pajamas, levitating and sliding out of bed before leaving the room into a hallway full of blank templates and incomplete models of Victorian Courtney. Different from the first episode, there's no voicing done by a computer generation, and the episode lacks any implementation of music. When talking to Kate in the bathroom, a difference we can note is that Kate gave Max sheet music instead of a copy of The October Country. Eventually, Vic and Courtney show up, and we find out that the Vortex Club is also non-existent, and here, they're instead called Club 23. When talking to Kate in her dorm room, the encounter is a lot less involved than in the final game, and the encounter simply has Max tell her to get help about the video before leaving the room. When leaving the campus of the school, there's no encounter with Warren here. In the final game, you're forced into a confrontation with Warren where he asks Max to the drive-in again. Another thing that we can see here is that Nathan is arguing with Kate instead of David at the sidewalk. Honestly, this kind of makes more sense than in the final game, where it's just David yelling at Nathan and it's never really followed up on. Here, it makes more sense for Kate to be confronting Nathan about the fact that he drugged her. From here on out, there's less and less to talk about because much more of the game is incomplete. Upon getting to the two whales, there's really not much here to see. The entire area map is explorable, but the scene in the diner is incomplete. When Max and Chloe leave to go to the junkyard though, funnily enough they do already have Frank looking on at the truck programmed in already. The junkyard is even more incomplete, with no car textures and missing models all over the place. The scene here is incomplete as well, with little to nothing occurring between Max and Chloe before Frank shows up, and then the scene immediately cuts to the train tracks. Max here then proceeds to T-pose her way to save Chloe, because the running animation doesn't exist yet. In the final game, when Max and Chloe return to the school, the duo have a conversation about chaos theory in Chloe's truck. However, here, the conversation doesn't exist. Instead, we have a weird, interesting scene of Max getting out of the truck and David looking on from afar. In the school, all conversations are incomplete, with the sole exception of the optional Warren photograph conversation with his science project. In the final game, you have to help Warren with his science project in order to obtain the optional photo. However, here, 
in order to get the optional photo, you have to make him fail by having his science experiment explode all over him. Ha. Huh. Finally, saving Kate from the roof is also incomplete. An extra option is available when talking to Wells, either saying Kate had something wrong or she didn't, though the scene is too incomplete to draw any conclusions about whether or not there were any changes to the script here. Eventually, episode 2 ends with an incomplete ending cutscene. Really, the most interesting thing that we can gain from the episode 2 clip, besides a lot of incomplete scenes, is the fact that Rachel was being described as Rachel in this episode, whereas episode 1 was referring her to Jesse still. Episode 3 is even more incomplete. The first major difference is that, besides incomplete scenes or missing models, is that the scene with Victoria and Jefferson is moved from them leaving the school to Max seeing it while her and Chloe are snooping around inside, though the conversation's contents remain the same. In the final game, when Max and Chloe are done in the school while investigating, they decide to go into the pool area. In the final game, Max and Chloe have to stealth their way out of the locker rooms in order to escape security. However, in the prototype, that doesn't exist. Oh no, not the stealth section! The stealth section in the pool! Because here, the stealth section takes place outside of the parking lot, with the two of them trying to get to Chloe's truck, which is honestly the most interesting thing to come out of this episode. The last thing of major note is that the kiss option is still present in of the game, but because the scene itself is incomplete, the option is given right after Max gets out of bed, leaving the context lost. In the final game, the kiss option comes up when Chloe dares Max to kiss her. However, we don't know if this was true early on or if the kiss had more meaning here. But that's pretty much it for this build of the game. Episodes 4 and 5 are barely accessible in this state, mostly taking Max to incomplete areas with broken lighting. The most interesting thing of note is in the debug room, listing the multiple endings. A hospital. Huh, wonder what that means. Eh, it can't be important. The What If prototype really only shows us the first three episodes, but I think it's definitely interesting for sure. It allows us to actually understand how early on that the final plot for the game was mostly finished, and that it was just structuring and building the game over time. Even the small glimpses and changes, things like confirmation that Warren was never really intended to be a love interest, or David stalking Max and Chloe, are just really fascinating to me. The idea that several names were just placeholders like Jesse Palmer and Aurora Creek are just really interesting to me because it makes you wonder why these were even changed in the first place. The last thing I'll note about the prototypes is that I find it really fascinating that the licensed tracks are present in episode 1. It shows how early on that the development team was interested in making sure that the soundtrack itself was a mix of both licensed and composed music. The blend of wanting both, according to Dontnod, was so that Morali's score would evoke nostalgic feelings, bolstered by licensed tracks that might tell more about a character than face value. And the fact that the composer is Jonathan Morali just means all the more, because the most powerful song in the entire game to me is Obstacles. That song is Life is Strange, and having Morali's band involved with most of the music is just really important in my opinion. It really is times like this that I wish we knew more about Life is Strange's pre-release history. There's so much about development that we don't know, and so much has never been told to us. The concept art that we have shows they had so many ideas that were simply never used, they were cut, and a lot of it we don't know why it was cut. And it's something that I definitely want to follow up on in a future video, where I talk about cut content and the reasons for why they were, because we do know a few reasons for why content was cut from the final game. Everything, though, led up to a certain point in August of 2014 at Gamescom, two months after that prototype had been made. Here we got our first true look at the newly titled game, Life is Strange, a story we soon forget.